Good evening and welcome to yet another episode of Money Control Masterclass. We are going to be talking about uh, a buzzword or term that has often been used in the last few weeks, digital rupee. Now, the finance minister mentioned in her union budget that India is going to have its own digital rupee or CBDC, the central bank digital currency, which will be introduced in 2022-23 itself. The RBI has also referred to the digital rupee in their monetary policy yesterday. Uh, they said they will do it cautiously. They are treading cautiously on it, but they haven't given a timeline. But before we get to digital rupee, what is digital rupee? How is it different from a physical rupee? How can it really be a game changer? To understand all that and more, we have four special guests to decode us. Remember, all of them are joining them uh, are joining us live on the show. So if you have any doubts, please feel free to keep sending it to us. Keep sending us those questions. Uh, we're joined by Sharad Sharma, the co-founder of iSprit. We have Rashmi Deshpande, who's with uh, who's a lawyer with Khaitan and Co. Nishal Shetty, the founder and CEO of one of India's largest crypto exchanges, Vazirex, as well as Subhash Chandra Garg, who is the former finance secretary. Thank you all very much for joining us. Sharad, I just want to take you through, you know, what the RBI deputy governor, Mr. Rabi Sankar, said yesterday. He said a digital rupee is going to be exactly like a physical rupee, but in digital form. So instead of storing it in your purse or wallet, you will be storing it on your phone and it will have one to one convertibility. But, you know, that's where my confusion is. My phone already has, you know, a Paytm wallet and a phone pay wallet. So what is this digital rupee that's going to be stored on my phone? How is it going to be different from the digital transactions that you and I already do? If you can just deconstruct and decode this for us. Sharad, I think you're on mute. No, I, I uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go on. So, uh, look, I can't speak for RBI. I can only speak for iSpirit here. Uh, see, the, the important thing to realize is that we are in the midst of a transition of uh, money to digital money, right? And, uh, and it has, digital money has many characteristics uh, and... Uh, and you know what RBI is signaling is that they are going to be uh, essentially offer a fiat back currency that would be available to us in a digital form. And uh, the important issue is what extent it will be programmable. And that is something that I think will become uh, manifest over time. Uh, because if you are looking, see, the, this is an important consideration to keep in mind. As you pointed out, India is one of the only countries in the world that has friction-free payments that is practically free for all intents and purposes, it is free. So a merchant, you know, I pay a merchant 100 rupees, they get 100 rupees, right? And this is not the case in other parts of the world. So if you go to Scandinavia, you have friction-free payments. You, you can pay with your credit card very easily, but the cost of that payment is relatively high between one to 2%. Uh, and then you can go to other parts of the world where even friction-free payments are you're not ubiquitous, right? Even many parts of the Western world, that is not the case. So India has solved this problem at scale. So therefore, just bringing, uh, uh, you know, another form of digital payments is not where the, the, the power of this lies. It lies in its programmability. And uh, that, and, and perhaps rightly so, RBI has not spoken about right now. But uh, that's actually the unsaid part of the story, and we should cover that some more uh, as we go forward. Sharad, you know, what do you mean when you say it's programmability? If you can just simplify that for us. Yeah, so look, ultimately, the, the whole uh, idea of thinking of a different ledger, currently, uh, you know, our money system lives on a ledger that is still with the bank, right? Uh, so when I transfer, let's say, 100 rupees to you, Chandra, it goes from my bank account's ledger to your bank account's ledger. And, uh, and you know, everything happens very quickly. It happens reliably. It happens, you know, without uh, cyber kind of security being uh, compromised. So, so that's 
the simple ledger entries that are changing. Now, <clears throat> what digital uh, uh, systems allow you to do is to allow some kind of trigger points to be established based on time or events. So, for example, in India, we have post-dated checks. They can be digitized. They're called eNash. Uh, e UPI has a system called eMandates where you can set rules for yourself, you know, about your future payments. So, for example, you want to pay Ola, you know, without having to, uh, without having to approve every transaction, you can set a rule saying, you know, I am okay paying Ola up till 2000 rupees a month every time they ask for it. Beyond 2000 rupees, it's not auto approved, right? So that's a rule. That's a trigger based payments. Now, when you have a programmable kind of a currency, then those those uh, triggers that you can set can be uh, can be uh, very interesting. Uh, now, when you combine that with something on the goods ledger, then actually the power of the system comes to life. For example, you know, if you have a goods ledger and in India, we have a rudimentary form of a goods ledger, which is called GST. And so if, for example, in that situation, you know, you can agree to have an invoice uh, where you know, I can, for example, agree to sell something to you and say that uh, that you are obliged to pay me 10 days after you receive my the apples that I sent you from my farm in Himachal, right? So now what happens is you can send set this rule, a commercial transaction rule in the system itself. So when it notices from your goods ledger that you receive the apples, then it says 10 days later, the payment has to be made. And these kind of uh, simple contracts that we are talking about then become possible. They are enforced within the system itself. And therefore, there is more trust that comes in because now it's possible for me to trust you much more. I know your payment will arrive 10 days after my apples reach you. And I won't have to follow up. I won't have to uh, pester you for a payment. So these kind of things become possible. Why? Because programmability is built in. And programmability applies merely not on the money ledger, but it also applies on the goods ledger. That is the opportunity before India. Indian opportunity is not to do what the West needs to do. See, West is realize the power of frictionless payments and they want to replicate it, but they can't replicate it. Why can't they replicate it? Because they haven't tied their banking systems together the way India tied the banking systems together. UPI is possible because it's built on top of IMPS. And IMPS took many, many years to tie the banking systems together. It was a scalable system. It was an immediate payment system. So had the IMPS not been there, there would have been no UPI. And most of the Western world doesn't have an IMPS-like system. So they can't get v UPI. So therefore, they are forced to go down and say, let's find a different way of doing payments, which is to reinvent the money ledger. In India, we don't need to reinvent the money ledger, but we need to reinvent the contracts that we do on top of the money ledger and the goods ledger. That is a problem that India needs to solve, that the West is already solved. They don't need to solve this because small contracts, they have a system of implementing them in their courts. Their court systems work very well for that. In India, it doesn't. And so, so this is really the trade-off. This is how we have to look at this differently from an India perspective than what you would look at it from a Western perspective. Got it. Mr. Garg, would you like to weigh in? Because uh, there's a divergence, you know, even in what the government said and what the RBI said. While the government said it's expected this year itself, 2022-23, the RBI said it will proceed cautiously. So, you know, do you think the RBI is being cautious and what could be the risks associated with a digital rupee or a CBDC? I think the question of cautiousness or when is it likely to come is tied in basically with what your original question was and which Sharad answered is what is the uh, what is this digital currency all about? You see, uh, the money is used for making payments. Money is essentially in two forms. One is the currency, which we uh, use the cash, which we keep in our pockets where everyone um, uh, sort of hands over that cash to buy and make payments. That is the currency part of it. The second part is your account money, which Sharad was talking about is ledger money, the bank money. Your money is in banks, which you use 
by UPI and many other methods to make payment to somebody else. So these are the two parts of the money. Today, we have rough, roughly about 30 lakh crores of physical money in, in the form of cash. And we have about 150 lakh crores of uh, the account money, which is there in the banks. And the, the payment system today in India, um, uh, with, which has become largely digital payments, uh, most payments, 97% by value, are made by using the, uh, the accounts money in the banks to make payment through different kind of digital wallets. You spoke about the Paytm or the IMPS or UPI and whatever, right? The crux of the announcement is that the physical cash or the physical currency is now to be digitized. And once you make the physical currency as the digital currency, then it should be possible to use the currency itself, not your bank, bank account money, which can continue to operate the way it is operating. The physical currency converted into digital currency can also be used to make all kinds of payments, right? That is the, 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 the thing which we are talking about when we talk about the digital rupee. Now, this is where the big challenge is. Uh, today, the physical payments and by volume, still about 80 to 85 percent payments in the country are physical payments because they are low value payments are used increasingly or mostly by the poorer people, the people who are not into uh, actively using the bank accounts, the people who make small purchases or who sells a small, uh, small things, etc. And therefore, this whole concept of the retail CBDC or retail digital money is what is relevant for the country, not the wholesale payment. Wholesale payments take place, uh, as we discussed, with the digital um, uh, uh, payments being made, made by using the bank money. Now, that is where the big challenge is. I think getting the digital uh, currency um, uh, sort of initiated in the country and making the small payments you uh, or small payers or the people use it digitally would be the most challenging. And that is where I think the difference between the government's anticipation and uh, a more guarded response from the Reserve Bank seems to be uh, explaining the thing. While the government would wish that these small payments which are being made uh, by the poorer people can get digitized and they use, they convert to the digital currency, the Reserve Bank realizes that it's not so easy. And I think that is where the difference uh, and the implementation challenge. My own view is that RBI would find it quite challenging to design an appropriate digital currency and a system, you can carry it on the mobile phones, you can do it elsewhere, they, can't, uh, they can come digital wallets, uh, which you can keep in your pockets in, in place of the physical wallets, but that's a big, big challenge going forward. Right. Interesting points there, Mr. Garg, including on the approaches. Um, Nishchal, what does a digital rupee or a CBDC mean for the future? of private cryptocurrency exchanges like yours? Because you know this is going to be CBDC currency issued uh, by the RBI. Um, and uh, the RBI yesterday, the governor was also very negative on private virtual assets. If you look at what he said, he said investors are investing in cryptocurrencies at their own risk and there is no underlying asset not even a tulip. That was his exact quote. He drew an analogy you know, with uh, tulips. So uh, clearly, the, the RBI is not gung-ho about uh, private uh, tokens. The government has slapped a heavy tax of 30%, which is, you know, the, the tax bracket that you have for things like gambling. So what will this mean for the future of private cryptocurrency exchanges like yours? Look, I think uh, uh, a CBDC just uh, makes everything more convenient, uh, especially if we were looking at only in the context of... Uh, uh, crypto businesses and exchanges, uh, CBDC makes it really convenient because um, you know people can then uh, just move those um, digital INR to any of the exchanges and start uh, exchanging them for any of the other uh, crypto they want to buy. And uh, uh, you know, 
it's it's just easier than uh, today where they have to use a bank account and then move that INR uh, to the exchanges. So I would say the friction reduces further if there is a CBDC uh, in the market. And uh, the existing crypto audience already knows how to use a, 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 a crypto wallet and how to transfer. So for them, this would be like their first class citizens of that uh, ecosystem where you know a CBDC would launch. So I think uh, in general, it will just be a boost to the crypto sector. Uh, tackling the whole, look, I mean, uh, intrinsic value is a very, uh, um, you know, it's a broad, uh, if you look at it broadly, um, I'm going to buy a Ether uh, token because I want to use it on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, without that, I can't run a program. So uh, if that is uh, not intrinsic value to the, Ether token, I don't know what is, but uh, the only way to run a program on a Ethereum blockchain is to use that token, and that's where the value comes from. So I think um, these are very subjective uh, definitions uh, of how we look at the underlying value of an asset. But uh, coming back to CBDCs, I think uh, I've been a proponent of CBDC because I, I believe that uh, it'll help India not just uh, from a local point of view, it's definitely amazing. Implementation challenges aside, uh, there are um, 200, 300 million people who are not in the digital economy. For them, it's as easy as using a WhatsApp application. They will just have to download an application. They're into the digital world because anyone can send uh, a CBDC to each other without needing a bank account as such. Uh, like Mr. Gurk said, very similar to cash. You know, just a mental model is what happens when cash, cash becomes digital. Uh, cash has never had an adoption issue. And I don't believe a digital uh, CBDC will have an adoption issue. If it is truly built in the way uh, cash operate, which is open and uh, anyone can send it to anyone, anyone can build applications, you know. Uh, uh, so so I think that that will increase the adoption of and those people who are not in the digital economy today for want of a bank account. We India has a potential to see them on board to the digital economy. But the other aspect that really opens up um, in a huge way uh, is the internationalization of the INR. If you look at uh, most of the websites today, uh, every one of them has a large number of Indian audiences that use these websites. And these websites are international websites. Um, with the CBDC, all of these websites can actually start accepting CBDC. But they don't have to really worry about any integration issues. They can clearly directly start accepting INR. And INR has the potential to become a mode of international payment as well. And if that happens, we can uh, see the INR getting stronger. It can compete with the dollar as one of those uh, global currencies. So I think uh, CBDC has a far uh, greater international value as well if uh, it becomes a reality. Um, I, I look forward to you know uh, getting uh, my hands on a CBDC. I hope it happens sooner than later. Right. Let's hope it happens sooner or later. I'm also curious about what they will call it. I think that, that should also be interesting. But Rashmi, you know, one more comment that uh, the RBI Deputy Governor made yesterday. He said uh, the work on CBDC is ongoing. Once the law is proposed and is amended, we can go ahead with our proofs of concept and pilot projects. So what law are they referring to here? Are they waiting for legislation on crypto to proceed with CBDC? Um, how the two connected, considering this is going to be, you know, issued by the RBI? question over there now uh, see as far as the laws and regulations are concerned there has to be a lot of changes that will have to be implemented or brought in in the current legislations cbdc is something uh, which is uh, which is not something that the fm or the government is uh, talking about only after this budget. In fact, before this budget last year, there was an announcement that they will be uh, introducing the CBDC and there will be a pilot project which will be introduced in the month of December. Of course, for whatever reasons, it got delayed. Uh, but what I feel is that because CBDC is a very mammoth task, it's not something that you, know, you just do a little tweaking as well as, uh, as as far as the digital currency is concerned and the next day you can use it. In fact, on three levels, you will have to bring in the change. The first level will be from a regulatory perspective. From a regulatory perspective, you will have to changes in terms of the current acts, 
uh, probably introduce certain definition, probably uh, highlight how the currencies are going to travel, uh, what is going to be the change in the AML, what is going to be the change in the cross-border movement of uh, uh, you know, currencies. Then, uh, of course, what is going to be uh, the penal provisions as far as any fraud in terms of this currency is going to be concerned. So there are going to be a lot of changes on the legal front that have to be taken place. Now, secondary, uh, in terms of technical platform also, while I suppose that, you know, there have been two incidences in the history of India, first the demonetization and after that the pandemic, which basically boosted the digital uh, transaction a lot more than what we had expected. Uh, and we could see that there were a lot of, there was a very intense penetration of digital transactions. There are still a lot of uh, section of people who are not aware or who are not very averse to technology uh, uh, in the sense that the introduction of CBDC can be extremely smooth. Therefore, the introduction of te technology in such a way that it penetrates the even the rural areas of India and it is very easy to use and at the same time, it's averse to cyber attacks because let's face it, this is a digital currency and there could be a lot of attacks of that sort. Unless and until a robust digital IT transaction is in the place, uh, introduction of CBDC will be very, very difficult. And finally, in terms of the monetary aspects or how you handle money. See, there are institutions in India everywhere in the world. You have your banks which are handling money. You have your uh, uh, government which is basically regulating money. The way the monetary policy is implemented as of now, it will have to go undergo a lot of change if CBDC has to be a very successful transaction. And while I agree with the panel that, you know, it's going to be a very good transaction and we all are looking forward to it, I suppose there is a lot of homework which the government has to do before we see CBDC. Interesting points there, Rashmi. A lot of homework the government has to do. Sharad, the other concern here is, you know, that the digital rupee must uh, guarantee some sort of anonymity because if everyone can see every transaction is being recorded and it's happening on the blockchain, it could lead to concerns around surveillance. How are we going to tackle this issue? Um, is the RBI looking at this at all? Is this, you know, a priority for the government? How, how are they going to address this concern around surveillance when it comes to digital rupees? See, first of all, you know, let's look at the plumbing. The plumbing will have to change. You know, we, we talked about the ledger system uh, uh, and Nishal also talked about that. Uh, so, you know, if you see the number of current uh, UPI transactions, IMPS transactions that we are doing, and if you see the number of GST transactions that we are doing, Ethereum 2 is not a substrate on which we can build. Because it does not handle the India volumes at all. So ultimately, the reality of this is that India has to build its own substrate. I mean, it will build it not only for itself, it will, but it will also build it for the world. And, and so this is ultimately, if we are really talking about not a toy implementation, you know, which is merely to signal uh, to the rest of the world that RBI frowns upon private currencies uh, that, you know, those 800 coins that are a thousand coins that are there and intends to you know curtail them uh, and really focuses only on the authorized currency which is cbdc or some form of stable coin if the intent is to only signal that then a toy implementation is sufficient but if you are really talking about volumes the indian volumes have to be then accounted for they cannot be accounted for as nishal said on ethereum 2 this is not practical today at today's volumes and at the rate at which we are growing UPI transactions, which is 6 to 8% month on month, is not going to be possible tomorrow. And especially if you are thinking of bringing the goods ledger. Of course, implicit in this is a new substrate. And I think that is going to be an important consideration to take into mind. 
and uh, and clearly you know we there, there is a lot of th thought that is going in at least uh, you know i spirit work is out in the open people can even go and look at it on github uh, and you can see their uh, cbdc implementation is merely a schema on this new public good which is currently called tentatively called the private public ledger so you have a private public ledger owned by the nation and then on top of that you know a cbdc is merely a schema and then you can experiment experiment with variations of anonymity variations of uh, reporting uh, you know very many variations all defined in a one page of code the schema and you can change it like version control you can try out different versions you can even do ab testing in different parts of the country and see which one will be more appropriate so all these are possibilities that we will have to come to and examine as we go forward the the so because india amongst the big countries is one of the larger ones to be embracing this in a serious way at this point in time so this is going to uh, this is going to manifest itself as we go forward got it um mr garg if we look at you know how china has done this they've also taken the cbdc approach they've you know uh, gone aggressive but they also doing it um in a multi year uh, phased way so even if you know the rbi kicks this off will it have a small start will it take you know will it happen in phases in many years because the rbi said it's testing wholesale and retail models and you know they are not ex uh, engaging any external agency so how is this roll out going to happen i mean if you can just uh, you know tell us how it will work so the roll out in a way has begun with the amendment in the rbi act having been carried out through the finance act itself so two important or three important changes have already been brought about number 1 the digital uh, rupee has been defined as equivalent to the bank notes which the rbi issues right so um, uh, conceptually and legally um, uh, a 500 rupee note which is physically issued or which is digitally issued by the rbi will have the same meaning and the same kind of uh, character that's what the deputy governor yesterday said it's one to one correspondence with the physical currency it is exchangeable convertible into it so that is the first step which has been taken there is another step which has also been taken by the finance act is to amend certain provisions or exempt certain provisions of the rbi act for the digital rupee one of the important uh, uh, exemption which has been made uh, and that i will bring the uh, to your earlier question i'll tie it up with that is that the rbi has been given complete authority to design this digital rupee and uh, 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 in terms of its denomination in terms of its uh, system technology everything unlike the earlier um, uh, currencies which we have had two basic currencies one is the coin currency silver rupee and the gold rupee kind of thing and the other one is the uh, fiat currency which is the paper currency both of them are uh, sort of uh, regulated and legalized by a, by specific law we have a coinage act we have paper currency act which Uh, have designed the system, given the legal cover to it, uh, banned the private uh, paper notes and others to be uh, the legal tender. Uh, but this time, the government, by amending the RBI Act, has literally given all these powers to the Reserve Bank rather than retaining it with the government. But when the Deputy Governor was speaking about that we are drafting something and we'll take it to the government to get a proper law in my judgment that would be the next step and the right step kind of thing once the rbi has conceptualized designed the technology and others that for the parliament and the government to enact a digital rupee uh, um, act kind of thing which will define the uh, all aspects of it now uh, uh, what choices the, uh, the 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 rbi and the government has and you refer to the chinese example chinese have not uh, adopted the 
uh, the Bitcoin kind of uh, crypto blockchain model where there is a common consensus for accepting the transactions. They have given that authority to the central bank uh, to accept the transactions. So it's, it's a permissionless kind of thing where there is no common consensus arrangement kind of thing. And they have piloted this. Now, RBI, when it looks at it, it can have that uh, experiment with, uh, with itself that you can go for a centralized uh, cryptocurrency kind of uh, model uh, for the currency. Or there are other alternatives. That's where I would um, suggest we, we as a nation look at very carefully. Just get, take take uh, example of the uh, dematerialization of the, uh, of the equities and the bonds. And today, millions and billions of uh, uh, equity uh, securities have been dematerialized, and they are transacted through um, applications, uh, digital applications, and otherwise, uh, in in numerous uh, uh, quantities today. Likewise, if we think of a dematerialized bank note uh, and use that for uh, that similar dematerialized based applications and technology to do uh, transactions using that rupee, I think that uh, that digital rupee, that perhaps might become a more uh, usable and people are familiar with that. Most of, most Indians are familiar with that. My, I would here also just touch upon one point which Nishchal made. Uh, I don't think there is any possibility of the digital rupee being allowed for international payments. Uh, international payments would be uh, governed, would continue to be governed with the Foreign Exchange Management Act today allows in respect to the physical uh, rupee. So that is perhaps not going to come. It's important that we do something about it, uh, especially because of the fact that so many stable coins have come and have taken over the international transactions. We can't wish it away, but I don't think that's at the time uh, in the in the horizon or in the thinking of the Reserve Bank. Interesting points there. Listen, you know, the China example again, China uh, has CBDC, I think Nigeria introduced something called e Naira, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So in these countries, what happened, you know, subsequently to private cryptos or private exchanges? Uh, do you see any parallels in India in the way this will happen going forward? Look, I think uh, there's a large misconception about uh, 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 CBDC and uh, um, the so-called private crypto. It's not private. Uh, these are all public um, blockchain, you know, uh, experiments. <laughs> but uh, for, uh, for the sake of uh, argument, if you call them private crypto, uh, a CBDC is supposed to be by default, uh, by design, supposed to be a stable currency and uh, not an instrument of investment. Uh, like you know, you're not going to be like you know. Uh, let me hold uh, ten thousand CBDC because it will grow in value. You're not going to do that. You're going to take it because you want to use it for transaction. So the the prime uh, uh, use case is transaction for a CBDC. Now now you flip it to the so-called uh, other crypto that exists. Um, very rarely would you see people saying, okay, let me hold some Bitcoin because I will use it for transaction. At least not in India. Uh, uh, even the rest of the world. While the narrative is being tried to say that you could use it for payments, you could, but would you? Uh, because everyone's buying it as an investment uh, for a simple fact that the value keeps uh, fluctuating uh, almost on a daily basis. So, so I, I really, um, uh, you know, I would say that a CBDC coming in has no effect on an investment category that has been created, which is the crypto that exists. So I don't think we have to worry too much about these two. Now the question is, uh, what has happened in other countries in terms of implementation? And implementation, if we get deeper into it, uh, the biggest problem that we'll see is that today there does not exist a blockchain which is actually capable of uh, running, uh, you know, tens of thousands of transactions per second uh, and uh, cheap or almost free uh, for uh, running a CBDC at the scale where you know we imagine. That definitely is an issue which. Uh, every country and even the crypto ecosystem in general is trying to solve and it will take time. So, you know, if you're thinking about CBDC, then we are thinking that uh, uh, in the next few years, 
we'll see them let's say in india we'll see them uh, you know overtake upi i don't think that's going to happen because uh, the technology also has to evolve to be able to support the kind of transactions per second that you see uh, on upi for example today but i think the step that we are taking as a nation is of prime importance where i'm sure uh, the details have to be worked out but it might start from use cases where uh, you don't need so many transactions per second and uh, there are uh, blockchain solutions out there that that could you know uh, you could bring in uh, to probably support uh, low uh, like let's say lower transaction per second use cases uh, simple example maybe the cbdc does not have to be to consumer directly it could start with just banks using it as a settlement layer amongst themselves where their uh, time to settlement uh, goes from whatever 24 hours one week to instant and we could see that happening so it can be a b2b only cbdc to start with uh, but the the prime important thing is that rbi gets into this rbi tries to you know build towards this and uh, understands and gains that expertise that is needed in the whole uh, cbdc area i think that is what is going to be the more interesting uh, fact out here uh, but yeah scalability i think uh, it's not a solved issue uh, everyone's trying to solve it um, and it will be solved but right now it's in the path uh, that solution hasn't really been uh, you know uh, out there and tested and where we can say there are 100000 transaction per second can happen and you should use this blockchain that hasn't happened yet mr do you see uh, this evolving as a stable coin like what's happening with the usdc do you you know see that path for this absolutely i mean uh, uh, see i think even the imf uh, just recently released that there are three ways in which uh, you could look at uh, a, a cbdc um, where stablecoin is one of the way which is a public private partnership where instead of the uh, government trying to do the heavy lifting and all the implementation they could allow private players to probably release their own uh, stable coins uh, which are backed by a, a cbdc and that's what is happening in the us uh, the us government uh, sort of is now trying to get bring in law to make it uh, you know sort of easier for people to release a stable coin because they see that path as a better way the other approach is where uh, the the central bank works with all the other banks which in turn then work with their consumers to bring in this uh, whole uh, uh, distribution of cbdc the third way is where the central bank directly goes to the consumers eliminating all of the banks in between and saying that you know you can directly use this cbdc so there are three different ways in which you can implement where a uh, uh, stable coin is one of the implementation which involves a public private partnership got it rashmi uh, the rbi also said it's proceeding cautiously because um, you know it's cognizant of risks around cyber security and counterfeiting so again i mean wouldn't a cbdc eliminate that why, why is the rbi saying that you know these are concerns which is why we are proceeding cautiously uh see when you are talking about fiat currency of course uh you know fiat currency comes with its own uh, problems that you know uh, it's open to theft it's open to all kinds of uh, uh, uh you know uh, uh, penal ways of handling uh and therefore just to avoid that if we go the cbdc way and you know just see to it that whatever the physical transactions are happening they are reduced and everything happens digital uh it's a good way of looking at it it is a very promising aspect in the near future however uh you can't deny the fact that when you are working uh, in terms in the digital world there are cyber attacks which will be bound to happen i mean we have seen and we read uh, every day that there are exchanges there are uh, other fraudulent activities which are happening on a daily basis so therefore for uh, for a transaction or, or for for bringing in a reform which is as big as a cbdc and we are not talking about cbdc ultimately just getting restricted to only some institutions if the cbdc has to be adopted by a nation like i said it has to be penetrated to the last possible person in the country and for you to do that you have to have your uh your network your it system to be extremely robust now it is not possible to make any it system so robust that it cannot uh you know uh, uh, i mean there will not be any sort of attacks so therefore 
what the government's hesitation is that yes there are going to be cyber attacks so they have to work on two fronts one is obviously like i said we have to make the uh, the the framework robust enough so that we can reduce the attacks and at the same time we have to make certain changes in the regulations be it the it act be it the ipc which sort of uh, identifies the kind of fraudulent activities that could possibly be associated with uh, cbdc transactions and based on this understanding change the laws introduce penal provisions so at least you know there is a deterrent that we are introducing so i can understand the hesitation and therefore uh, what the government should do is basically come up with a pilot as soon as possible they have already gone ahead and uh, you know made the announcement in the budget i am hoping that you know the next announcement comes that you know we are going to introduce the pilot pro uh, project in such a way so in the pilot you identify what are the loopholes and then you accordingly amend your it system and amend your laws right um you know we are coming to the last 10 minutes and we have a lot of viewer questions so sharath maybe you can take this um this is a question coming from ramki he says money typically performs three functions um it's a unit of account a store of value and a medium of exchange how would the cbdc play these functions as different from other cryptocurrencies see there is whether we like it or not you can read from the government statements there is a tussle between you know what are essentially uh, private currencies on so called public blockchains right i mean and the question is you know you you have frequent flyer miles that's a private currency i can buy you know magazine subscriptions from it i can buy many things from it and there are certain restrictions on how that operates it's a closed system you know so clearly you know there is a tussle there is a undercurrent of a tussle between you know what is happening on the uh, on the official currency side on the official plumbing side and what's happening in the crypto world and that there, there are a lot of these signaling that you are hearing from the government and from the rbi has to be seen in the context of where they want this to land right i mean so this is clearly one aspect of what we are talking about now in what uh, the question that was asked is that there is a feature of digital money that is not there in the traditional money whether it is upi type of money or paper type of money and that is programmability and that program programmability the question to ask is is that useful for india and if it is useful for india should that be introduced in the years to come and 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 the answer to that i think is a resounding yes so that you know is where i think eventually we will end up because this there's no there's no big attraction in merely replacing upi based bank transactions with uh, e rupee type of transactions uh, you know because it doesn't give you anything big uh, because there's frictionless and low cost there that's what you will get in the new system the only thing that you get is program programmability so this is a new element that is going to come in uh, and and of course a timing and a lot of statements are not so much about the e rupee they are equally and i would say more so about what rbi and government's posture is to all the other stuff that is happening on crypto and look i don't have a uh, i i don't i have many comments there you know they can do what they like and you know i am not an involved party in that uh, in that kind of a discussion so so really uh, i i feel eventually our focus will come down to what kind of programmability we are able to provide uh, to the participants of that transaction and if you are able to provide that programmability then it allows us to build trust in our commercial transactions in a way that we don't have today why don't we have that trust because today when i make a soft promise to you it is impossible for you to enforce it and uh, why because if you go to courts this is something that will not be settled for a long time to come so if that soft promise 
is enforceable in code, right? Then we are able to attack the next layer uh, of the problem. We've already made our systems presenceless with Aadhaar, with eSign. We made them paperless with DigiLocker and UPI. Now is our time to address the last leg of this, which is to do with commercial trust. And if we can attack commercial trust using systems like this, the 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 benefits of that, uh, in terms of commerce, in terms of uh, our our economic might, are very very significant. And this is an easier path for us to follow than the large scale judicial reform that is also desirable, but is unlikely to happen in the same time frame that we are looking at right now. Got it. Um, Mr. Garg, this question is from Shyam Banerjee. He says, when a new currency is issued, usually devaluation occurs. How will you deal with such inflation? No, not really. Uh, uh, the uh, Whenever the new currency uh, is issued, uh, uh, it is the replacement of the existing currency. It happens gradually. Uh, the paper notes were issued over about 50, 60 years and they gradually replace the silver uh, rupee and the gold rupee. And when the digital rupee comes, it's not going to happen overnight that the digital rupee will replace the 30 lakh crores of the, uh, of the physical uh, notes which are there. It will come in, its adoption will start with some people, uh, and over many years, I don't see it happening in uh, less than 20, 25 years when majority of Indians would switch over to the digital rupee. And I also don't see that um, the digital rupee would completely replace ever the physical rupee. Today, even the, the coins are not completely gone. They are much smaller, but they do play uh, some role in the payment system. Likewise, when the digital rupee comes in, over the years, uh, even after its adoption increases, the, uh, the physical rupee will continue. And there is no harm in that. Um, the people who find uh, the cash, physical cash, to be used more conveniently, um, uh, it should be available to them. So I don't think we should see digital rupee as being a complete replacement of the paper notes. Got it. Mr. Garg, if you can take this question uh, as well, a follow-up question. Will it be more profitable for the central bank to issue CBDC as opposed to paper currency? Uh, because, you know, it will lower costs. See, uh, that also, there is a lot of uh, talk about this, that CBDC will save central bank hell of a lot of uh, money. Today, the paper currency's cost is 0.01% of the uh, uh, notes which exist in the system. It's about three to 4,000 crores every year, which uh, the RBI spends in getting the new notes printed, et cetera, and, and circulated. It's not a very large cost, so it's a minor cost. Uh, the digital system will also probably have some cost which uh, the RBI will have to meet. Uh, uh, the dematerialization and the uh, depositories which will need to be created or uh, any other form of the digital technology. I don't think crypto uh, blockchain technology would be used or even if it is used in a modified manner, uh, there would be some cost for that institution to function. Uh, I don't really believe that uh, the CBDC, switch over to the CBDC, would be enormously uh, uh, cost saving to that. There is another aspect also, um, uh, which was touched earlier, uh, while there is a lot of talk that uh, CBDC can enable direct uh, currency transaction or uh, uh, people can hold the account with the, uh, with the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, I don't think that's feasible in the country with um, 130 crore people uh, holding some some uh, currency or some uh, notes or digital notes at least having account with the central bank uh, it should be possibly it would be done in the manner in which the physical currency is uh, is, is is circulated today uh, the reserve bank would probably give the digital currency to to the banks 
and to some of the pr private people organizations directly but it will be dealing only at the wholesale level of distribution and then after the the digital currency uh, would be going the way today the banks distribute the physical currency of course that would be not through uh, in in physical form and that would not be through the bank account form but it will be through the direct uh, rails which the digital technology would, would build would built into got it um sharad if you can take this how will the money multiplier effect work considering the cbdc will be held directly by the rbi in fact this is an interesting point that i read recently as well what happens to fixed deposits and what happens to the impact on lending and credit creation if you're going to have this cbdc held by the central bank you know i i think uh, uh, you know dr chandra of uh, uh, answered that i think in his view that is not going to happen right and uh, clearly i i think uh, there is a there, uh, ultimately you know instead of a multi layer kind of a banking system that you have you could have a single layer banking system but as i think was mentioned right now i don't think we are on that path uh, as as of now now the question is is that a desirable place to get to and if we do get there you know what does what happens to uh, the lending system particularly you know that's kind of critically important because the lending system relies on you know uh, 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 capital reserve ratios uh, you know deposits and 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 lending book and there is tightly regulated in 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 those aspects i don't think this is at this that is indeed as many of you pointed out is a 10 year 20 year journey um, i think at this point in time the prominent goal is that we have in circulation a digital asset that does not pay taxes and that does not abide by our anti money laundering laws and i think uh, there is there is a desire to uh, to see if that can be curtailed because i think as a society not just in india you can see that's happening in china and you can see it more clearly with bank of international settlements which is the central bank to central banks you know they are taking a position that these two societal consensuses that have emerged over time that yes anti money laundering is important yes payment of tax on wealth that you create capital gains that you create is important and that cannot be surrendered uh, you know for the sake of these new instruments that are coming so i think right now the focus is on that uh, not on a overhaul of the two tier kind of a banking system that we have having said that when we look back 20 30 years from now i think there will be substantial changes in the two tier banking system but i don't think if they are going to happen they are imminent in the next 2 3 or perhaps 3 years and uh, and and those substantive changes that will happen on not longer time horizon i think are worthy of a session by itself i don't think we'll be able to cover them in the time that we have right right um final question both for nishchul and rashmi what's the best case and the worst case scenario for private virtual assets and crypto exchanges if this rollout happens um should i go first Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, and let Rashmi look, have the last word. Yeah. yeah. Um, the best case, uh, like I said, uh, adoption of uh, crypto skyrockets if uh, CBDC comes into the picture, and uh, that's a great thing because uh, suddenly you know you go from twenty um, million odd people in India who understand how crypto works to hundred million, two hundred million, or even more uh, people who get to know and understand how this whole ecosystem works. So CBDC, I would say, is great for. Uh, uh promoting the knowledge and understanding of uh, this new technology called crypto and i think uh, uh because of that it's hard for me to think of a worst case for uh, uh, uh you know crypto exchanges with cbdc coming in i don't like i said they're two parallel tracks and i don't see them uh, uh causing issues uh, for each other it's just uh, advantages that i can see right now i'm sorry i don't have a worst case <laughs> this will you you know the, the permanent optimist it is said to go whether the government's talking about a ban or a tax or a tds so uh, i guess it's good to be optimistic you always see the half uh, you know the glass half full 
Rashmi. And things have been getting better, you know. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah, at least there is a at least the government has acknowledged cryptocurrency as an asset now. You know, that's what the taxation implies. Rashmi. Yeah. Uh, see, I I don't see in a sense, yeah, in terms of adopting technology, if let's say CBDC flourishes, then digital transactions, be it buying virtual assets or anything else, it's going to be easy. Yes. But what I suppose is that CBDC is going to have a larger impact, larger impact in terms of our monetary policies, larger impact in terms of the existence or flourishing of institutions like banks, a larger impact in terms of, you know, uh, the the people, uh, the, the, the time taken for exchanges and transactions to happen. So overall, if CBDC flourishes and it's a success story, then I suppose, you know, we are going to have a completely different financial framework in India. So I, I sincerely hope that CBDC is, uh, you know, introduced successfully and t uh, all the issues, uh, whether it is some kind of a cyber attack or any other issue related to it, eventually is, uh, you know, taken care of. And I, I suppose that, you know, we are, we may not be far away from a time when we have to basically frame all the notes of the denomination, put them on the wall and, you know, keep it for our next generation should they know what the, you know, paper currency looked like. Wow, that's quite an amazing scenario you've uh, painted for us, uh, Rashmi, you know, <laughs> framing notes on the wall. I don't know if that's going to uh, happen, but let's wait and see how that unfolds. But on that note, thank you all very much for joining us. And perhaps we should repeat this panel once the RBI, you know, uh, rolls out a pilot or uh, rolls out something in the first phase so that all of us are able to visualize how this happens. But on that note, thank you very much, uh, Sharad, Rashmi, Mr. Garg and Nishal for joining us to thank deconstruct... You what is a digital book thank you very much thank you thanks